Right, welcome back folks. This is the third and final part of our lecture on, about exploring data in the experimental design and analysis section of Core Skills. And what we're going to do in this final part is have a look again at um, distributions, which we've already touched on briefly. And we're going to look at how we can make use of the properties of distributions to put confidence intervals on our estimates of uh, measures of central tendency, so the mean in particular, which gives rise to the idea of putting error bars on a graph, and we're going to have a look at that. And then we're going to look at um, some common distributions that we typically encounter in the life sciences. So, first really important point to make is thus far I've been talking about collecting data and then describing the data and trying to spot patterns or interesting um, properties of the, those data. And all of this is actually predicated on the assumption that the data reflect what's going on in the real world, that we have, as scientists, only ever a limited view of the world in the sense that we can't collect data on everything. So we have a sample, as it's known, of the available data, and we want that sample, hopefully, to tell us something about the underlying population, as it would be called in statistical terms. So in the case of the sperm example, we're measuring a number of individual sperm and hoping that they represent the overall, the total population of sperm that we're trying to describe or understand. So in order for a sample to be representative, it needs to be taken at random from the population. It'd be no good if you, for example, were looking at a sperm sample and you only chose the sperm that was, looked like they were swimming quickly or you only um, sampled the hyena latrines, which were really big and therefore visible from a distance. Instead, if you want to get a representative sample that tells you about the whole population, you need to have some way of randomly sampling individuals from that population. And that's a really important underlying idea in experimental design and analysis, and every life scientist needs to be aware of that issue. So, Thus far, we've we've produced measures, uh, descriptions of our data, both of central tendency and variability, and probably the two most important are the mean and the standard deviation. And we've calculated those from the sample. So we have a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. Each time we take a sample, we're going to get a slightly different mean and a slightly different standard deviation, even if we're taking it from the same population. And that's because we're sampling at random. So we're going to get different individuals each time. So next time I select some sperm to measure their speed, I'm probably going to find the results slightly different, slightly different mean, swimming speed, slightly different standard deviation. So in reality, the sample mean, x bar, and the sample standard deviation, s, are estimates of the underlying population mean and standard deviation. And in stats language, the sample properties, like the mean and the standard deviation, are normally written in Roman characters, X and S in this case, whereas the population parameters that we're trying to estimate are written in um, Greek letters. So the population mean is typically indicated by the Greek letter mu and the standard deviation by the Greek letter sigma. So um, that's worth remembering, that little trick. If you see um, in any kind of scientific paper or textbook Greek letters describing a data set, they're probably talking about the over underlying population, whereas if you see Roman characters, in other words, our normal alphabet, then they're probably talking about the sample. Okay, so, so far you're thinking, yeah, this is all very boring. Um, how does it actually affect what we do in the real biological world? Well, it turns out that if you understand the relationship between your sample and your population, then you can make some interesting conclusions, inferences, as we would say, about the underlying data set and hence make progress in understanding the biology of the system you're studying. Um, and classically, what we very often do is make the assumption that the underlying population we're studying follows a particular distribution, and the commonest distribution it would follow would be the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution which uh, you've, I'm sure, encountered before. Sometimes it's just called the bell curve. And this is a distribution that has known mathematical properties. And if our underlying population of sperm or hyena latrines looks like a normal population, then we can start to make really quite specific inferences from any sample that we collect from that population. This will all become clear in, in a few slides time, hopefully. So let's look at the normal distribution. Here it is on, on screen. Looks like a bell curve, 
that's kind of what you'd expect. In other words, what it's saying is most individuals in the population are close to the mean. So we've got the mean in the middle of the distribution here, the mean mu of the population. In this case, let's think about our sperm with their swimming speeds. And we've got some variation around that mean, which is described well by the standard deviation, sigma. Uh, notice, by the way, this is lowercase sigma in the Greek alphabet. The big thing that looked like a capital E in the um, when we were doing sums, that's capital sigma, and that's always used for summing. So it's just a, bit a coincidence that sigma is used twice in two different ways here. So we've got a measure of central tendency showing the middle of this distribution and a measure of spread or variance uh, showing how wide the distribution is. But the key property of the normal distribution is that it's lovely and symmetrical. So you have tails on either side of a big bulge, which tells you that most individuals in the population, most sperm in this case, are similar to the mean, but a few of them have very high values and a few have very low values. And um, in this case, we mean sperm that swim very fast or swim very slowly. And this distribution crops up time and again in biology and in other fields of science, and it has particular properties which you can actually write down mathematically and they're really useful. So one crucial property is that about 68% of the individuals in a population will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. And as you'll see later on, that turns out to be useful. And about uh, nine, well, exactly 95% of the population will lie within 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. So in other words, we can use the standard deviation to quantify the proportion of individuals that we'll find uh, looking a particular way in terms of the thing that we've measured. Um, so we'll see how that's useful in a second. And to show you how it's useful, I'm going to kind of develop another example. This time, we're going to look at some data from the human popula population on life expectancy. And um, this graph here is a, a still from a, a video I'm about to show you, or a kind of animation. And each blob on this graph is a different country. So uh, for each country, we've got an estimate of life expectancy on the y-axis and income, or GDP, on the x-axis. So this is how wealthy countries are, and this is how long you're expected to live. And you can see, roughly speaking, a positive relationship between these things. Wealthier countries tend to have greater life expectancies. But of course, each of these blobs represents not just a single person, but a whole population uh, in each country. And in fact, the size of the circle here indicates the size of the country's population. So the big circles here are China and India. You can see these big, reddy, pinky colored ones. Now, what we're saying here is that we've got a measure of life expectancy for a whole, well, a billion people in the case of China. Surely we haven't gone and followed a billion people through from cradle to grave to work out how long they live. And of course, no, we haven't. We've taken a sample of them to find out what the typical or average life expectancy is. And that's what's plotted on this axis here. And similarly, we've calculated the average GDP per person. So in both cases, the X and the Y axes give us estimates of the average for the underlying for the underlying population, but they're based on samples. Just as I was saying, we take a sample, we calculate the mean and the standard deviation, and they represent or they estimate the underlying population parameters. So the population parameter we're trying to estimate, both for life expectancy and income, is mu, the underlying mean, and we do that with a sample. So um, we're going to look at what happens with the mean and the standard uh, deviation as we change sample size in a moment. But I just want to show you this video first. So if I click on this, hopefully, we'll go through to um, the browser. Uh, this is a really cool website called Gapminder. It's well worth having a play with. They've got loads of really cool data sets. Um, and it's basically a website dedicated to trying to demystify stats for the general public. And um, this is just a really nice animation. This is now 2019, so this we've got the updated version of this data set. And I'm going to press play. And what we're going to see is the data set starting from the beginning of the 19th century. So everybody's a lot poorer. And look, the life expectancy is down here, like 30 to 40 years. So people are dying really early and they're poor, poor in terms of modern equivalent income. And what's happening as we go through the 19th century is people are starting to get a little bit wealthier. But the yellow blobs here are Europe. OK, so European people are getting wealthier and living longer, but everybody else is not really. Um, and then we've got North America starting to catch up here. And then as we move into the latter part of the 20th century, a really dramatic change is taking place. 
in that, well, everybody is living longer and everybody, more or less, is getting wealthier, even by standard modern terms. And yet the relationship still holds. So the blue blobs here are the African countries, and African countries are almost all poorer than countries elsewhere in the world, and life expectancy is lower, down at maybe 60 to 70 years now, um, compared to 80 to 90 in Europe, North America, Japan, and places like that. So this is a fun, a fun animation which kind of shows, well, it shows two things. Arguably, this what we're seeing in the still here is a depressing message that a lot of people in the world live a lot less longer than we do because, um, well, or at least as a result of an association with poverty. Um, but it also shows a good news story in the sense that when we go back to the 19th century, you can see just how dire life was then compared with now. So yes, there are lots of reasons to be concerned about inequality in today's world. I certainly am. But on the other hand, um, you know, we have come a long way. So there are reasons to be positive. Anyway, that's a sort of digression, really. I want to go back to the lecture now um, and talk about these uh, data points and, and what they really mean. So what we're trying to do here, if we just focus in on the uh, life expectancy data, is calculate what the underlying average population longevity is. Um, now, let's just assume we know that the underlying population mean is 81 years, as it roughly speaking is in the UK. Um, Let's imagine now we go to that population with a true mean uh, life expectancy of 81 and we sample people to find out when they died. Uh, so we could look at death records or whatever for a random selection of people. And on what I've got on screen here is three random selections of three people each. And then I've calculated the sample mean life expectancy for each sample. So the first one, the average is 85 years. So these guys, these three individuals picked at random, just happened on average to live rather longer than what we know is the true underlying average. This middle sample here, however, has three people, one of whom actually died in their early 60s, and so the average life expectancy appears to be, well, it's only about 72 years, quite a lot lower than the true underlying mean. And in the third sample, well, the average ends up being very close to the true mean, we happen to have picked three people who are quite similar to the average. So what this is illustrating is the fact that samples don't tell you everything, that the estimated mean life expectancy is not always completely accurate, and that each sample we take will give us a slightly different estimate. And those estimates are going to fluctuate, vary rather, around the true underlying mean. So this is what happens with a sample size of three. But watch, watch what happens when we increase the sample size to 10 we get the same phenomenon, three slightly different estimates of the underlying population mean from three samples, but this time they're all much closer together. So 79, 78, 82.5, they're all very close to the true underlying mean of 81 years. So what's happened is we've increased the sample size, which has increased the accuracy of the estimate. We've got more confidence in these estimates of life, life expectancy than we had in the uh, smaller sample sizes that we saw on the previous slide. And this is a really important idea that as sample size goes up, our confidence goes up because the estimates get better. And if only we could understand that relationship properly, then we could, every time we say something about a data set, like we quote the mean, we can tell somebody, tell the reader or the listener or whatever, not just what the mean is, but how confident we are about that mean. And that's where we're heading in terms of confidence intervals and error bars. So um, as it happens, because normal distributions follow a very predictable mathematical formula, we can un understand exactly how our confidence in the mean increases with sample size, as long as the underlying population is normal or Gaussian. And in many biological situations, it's reasonable to assume that it is. So as the sample size increases, the estimate of mu, the underlying population mean, gets better. Um, and if, uh, if we then plot the distribution of sample means, we get an interesting phenomenon. So on the right, left hand side here, we've got the situation where I'm taking three individuals at random. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep taking three individuals at random over and over again and build up a distribution of estimated mean ages at death. So these are the sample means on the x-axis and here's the frequency at the side. What we're going to get if we do that is over time, we're going to build up a bell curve where the middle of the bell curve is 
very close to the true underlying population mean of 81 years. Each sample is different, so there's variation. We get the odd sample where the mean is very high, the odd sample where the mean is very low. And because the sample size is small, there's a quite a lot of variation here. The standard deviation of this bell curve is quite big because with only three individuals per sample, occasionally you'll hit three people who live into their hundreds and occasionally you'll, meet, uh, you'll sample three people who died before they got to 50. So the means of the samples are much more variable here, as we've seen with a sample size of three, than they are here. So this is the same kind of distribution plotted. This is the distribution of the means plotted for a sample size of 10. And you can see that those means are much more tightly clustered around the true underlying population mean of 81 years. So the standard deviation of that uh, distribution of means has got much, much smaller as a result of an increase in sample size and an increase in confidence in our estimates. And it turns out that that is the property we make use of to describe our confidence. Because we can look at this, we can use the standard deviation of this curve, the degree of spread in this bell curve, to describe our confidence. Here, the spread is large, our confidence is low. Here, the spread is low, small, our confidence is high. So um, what we do is we do exactly that. We use the standard deviation of the distribution of the means as a measure of a confidence in the estimate. So um, you may have encountered this standard deviation before, um, just like any other standard deviation. Uh, all 68.25% uh, uh, of the data will be within one standard devi deviation of the mean. So in this case, 68% of the sample means, if we keep on doing this sampling over and over again, will be within one standard deviation of the true mean. And this thing, this standard deviation of the means, is called the standard error of the mean. So you'll quite often see SEM, or standard error of the mean, plotted on a graph or quoted in a table in a scientific paper or a textbook. And it's a standard measure of our confidence in the mean because it tells us how variable the sample means would be if we were to, to, to repeat the sampling effort that's been done over and over again. Um, and the really nice thing about the standard error of the mean is that you can calculate it from just a single sample. You don't need to repeatedly sample over and over again. Just from one sample of three people or 20 sperm, I can calculate the standard error of the mean using this clever mathematical trick. We take the standard deviation of the sample. So this is now the standard deviation of the sample, not of the mean. So if I've got three people, it's the standard deviation of the life expectancy of those three people, how much the average person, person varies in that sample. Divide it by the square root of the sample size and hey presto, we have got the standard error of the mean or the standard deviation of the means if we were to repeatedly sample with that same sample size. Um, so this is what you'll see very often quoted when you're looking at people, uh, when people are describing a data set, giving you a measure of central tendency like the mean and then giving you the standard error to tell you how confident they are about their mean. Um, so in the case of our sperm sample, the standard error of the mean is 0.092. Um, which, you know, on the face of it is quite difficult to interpret, but the, I suppose the key thing to do is think, here's the mean swimming speed, which was, sorry, here's the standard deviation swimming speed, which was 0.4. Uh, yeah, we need to see the mean actually to make sense of it, so bear with me a second. Um, before we look at how this compares to the mean, uh, I'm going to tell you about another standard measure of confidence, because there are actually two very commonly used measures of confidence. We've got the standard error, which we've already met, and now we've got something called the confidence interval. And in fact, the standard error of the mean is a special example of a confidence interval. It's the 68.25% confidence interval. But very commonly, you'll get the 95% confidence interval quoted. So this is the sort of thing that you'll see quoted on government stats about COVID. Um, it's a standard measure of our confidence in the mean. And it's 1.96 times the standard error because 95% uh, of the means will fall within 1.96 standard deviations of the true underlying population mean if you repeatedly sample at the same sample size. And in the case of our sample, it's 0 0.180 millimetres per minute. That's our 95% 95, 95 confidence interval. So let's look at what that actually looks like. Um, here I've shown you a graph of, uh, again, swimming speed as we increase the sample size. So I'm just taking sperm at random from a um, population. 
with initially a small sample size of five, moving up to a big sample size or bigger sample size of 20. And what you can see is that the, the estimate of the mean from each of these samples is slightly variable, but it's all kind of homing in on the true underlying mean, which must be around 2.3 millimeters per minute. But crucially, these error bars, which I've plotted, are getting smaller as the sample size goes up. And those error bars represent plus or minus one standard error of the mean. So what that's showing you is within this error bar, around this average here, this mean here, that's where 68.25% of the samples would lie if the true underlying mean was here where the sample mean was. So it tells us how much confidence, or it kind of gives us a visualization of our confidence in the mean. Basically, that you know the sample mean might be here, but it's kind of telling us that the true mean is quite likely, more likely than not, to be somewhere in this bracket region here. If we only had a small sample size, we'd have a much wider margin for error, a much wider confidence interval. So we'd be much less certain about where the true mean really lie uh, lay. Uh, and we can plot the same thing, because I've plotted standard error here, but I could plot the 95% confidence interval uh, as well, which would be a very common thing to plot. Um, and both of them tell you the same thing, essentially, but you just uh, uh, you need to know what proportion of the means will lie within one standard error of the underlying population mean to understand exactly the differences between the different error bars. But really, they're a visual aid. OK, so, so far, we've talked about normal distributions like uh, they're kind of like what you find in, in life sciences. And sometimes they are, very often they are. But often, data don't come from normal or Gaussian populations. So um, in the case of the sperm swimming speed, we did have a roughly symmetrical distribution, which peaks kind of in the middle, um, and it has long tails on either side. It looks a little bit normal. Now, you might be looking at, that, uh, looking at it thinking it's not very normal. Well, that's partly because we've got a fairly small sample size, so it's rather lumpy, which is what you'd expect just by chance. But if I increase the sample size, I'm pretty sure I would start to see a nice smooth bell curve. Um, so it's going to look something like this in which case it's probably reasonable to assume a normal distribution and therefore um, we can use the properties of the normal distribution to um, understand the sample and the population as we have done in the previous slides. But what I want to highlight here is the fact that many distributions in life sciences are not normal. So you can take a continuous measure like sperm, sw sperm swimming speed and find a distribution that's skewed. So for example, you might see right skew like this. So when you are describing skew, you are describing, um, you sort of label the tail. So if the tail's on the right, if the long tail is on the right, then it's a right skew. If the long tail's on the left, it's left skew. So a lot of populations might look like this. So this would be quite common, for example, if you're measuring the time it takes for something to happen in life sciences, the time it takes for a biochemical reaction to happen or for an individual in a population to die. Um, you can't have a negative duration for something to happen. So the distribution is bounded at zero, but you can get some individual observations that are very large. Sometimes you see the opposite, you see left skew. This is a bit less common, um, because if you think about it in, in the life sciences, it's relatively unusual to have an upper bound to a data set where the numbers can't get bigger than a particular value, but there are some situations, as we'll see. Um, and sometimes it doesn't look remotely normal. Sometimes the distribution is really strongly skewed or um, shows some other shape uh, and so like I said already right skew like this this is really extreme right skew is quite common with time data also it could be say temperature data you can't go below absolute zero uh, percentage data will often show a very lopsided distribution because you can't have less than zero percent but you also can't have more than a hundred percent so that's a distribution where if the mean is close to a hundred percent you might well get left skew as opposed to right skew as you can see here so why does all this matter? In fact, why have I been telling you all of this stuff about distributions? Um, the answer is that we make use of the normal distribution in order to run statistical tests on data. Um, and they allow us to answer questions about data under the assumption that the data follow a normal distribution. And that those tests are called parametric tests, parametric statistical tests. And they're really powerful, really handy, really useful. Um, but they all assume that the underlying data follow a particular distribution. By contrast, when you have data which don't follow a normal distribution, you may have to run some analysis which assumes nothing about that distribution. 
Because if you're making false assumptions about a data set, then everything that you conclude uh, based on the stats is going to be wrong. So there are a bunch of tests called non-parametric statistical tests, which don't assume anything about the distribution. They're sort of mathematically simpler in a way. Um, and they allow you to cope with or to analyze data sets when the data don't look like they follow a normal distribution. They tend to be relatively conservative, these tests, because um, they uh, don't assume anything. Uh, right, so I just want to um, finish really by having a quick uh, whiz around thinking about different types of distribution that you might encounter, not just the normal distribution. So if we go back to the hyena data, if you remember I was counting the numbers of scats per latrine for hyenas, and we saw a fairly right skewed distribution here with a long tail on the right hand side, which is very common for count data. Um, and um, I express the count data on a frequency histogram like this, but I could very easily um, convert that to a probability distribution like this, just saying what's the probability of an individual latrine having a particular number of feces um, or scats, and I um, could just replot it with probability on the y-axis. Uh, and that's just how we tend to uh, define distributions and that right skewed distribution is very common in um, count data when we count things so here we were counting feces but we could be counting the number of bacteria on a petri dish or the number of molecules in a test tube and um, when we do that we have discrete data quantitative data um, and they typically, when you're counting something, can't go below zero. So they are bounded on the left-hand side. So you can't really very often have a long tail on the left-hand side, but you can have a long tail on the right-hand side. So these data, uh, this, sorry, this distribution that you tend to see with count data um, is often modeled mathematically very well by a thing called a Poisson distribution. So we've had the normal distribution. Well, a Poisson distribution is really great for describing discrete count data. The normal distribution is really good for describing continuous data uh, where the mean is in the center of the data set and you have a symmetrical spread of values around that. So the Poisson distribution is great for describing count data but it has some interesting properties. When the Poisson, the mean of the Poisson distribution is high, like I've got here, I've plotted a Poisson distribution with a mean of 5.5, as I let's just flick back as opposed to a mean of 3 here. So that's a Poisson distribution with a mean of 3, which was what we actually found in the hyenas. Um, and here it is with a mean of 5.5. Notice how the graph has got a lot more symmetrical. It's not quite symmetrical yet, but it's got more symmetrical. The higher the mean of a Poisson distribution, the more it looks like a normal distribution. And so actually, very often, when we're counting things in the life sciences, if the mean is high enough, then we can get away with assuming a normal distribution rather than worrying about a Poisson distribution, which makes life a lot easier because we already understand mathematically the properties of the normal distribution. Or if you don't, like most normal biologists, your computer does, and there's a whole bunch of statistics which assume that normal distribution. But nevertheless, you're going to need to know about the Poisson distribution in some situations. Um, now the Poisson distribution only really applies where there isn't an upper bound, an upper boundary to the number of individuals, uh, sorry, to the, to the size of the data point. So in our case, the number of scat per latrine could in theory be immensely large for hyenas. There's no natural upper limit, but there are situations where there is a natural upper limit. So for example, if I was looking at hyena clans, so hyenas hang around in groups, um, and those groups uh, are sort of typically about 10 animals in size. Um, and I was looking at the sex, the number of males, the sex ratio in those clans. Then what I would find is that there is a kind of upper limit to the number of hyenas in a clan that can be of one sex. And the upper limit, of course, is all of them. So let's say I took a whole set of samples of 10 hyenas clans of size 10, then the maximum number of males is going to be 10 out of 10, and the minimum is going to be 0 out of 10. So this distribution, if I was looking at the counts of the numbers of males, would actually be bounded both at 0 and at some upper limit. And actually what we're looking at here is what's called the binomial distribution. 
So where we have discrete data, where each individual is actually a one or a zero, in this case, each hyena is either male or female, but it might be looking at some bacterial cells saying, well, which ones of them are dead and which ones of them are alive, or which ones are expressing a particular gene and which ones aren't. In each case, each data point is binomial. It's a zero or a one. And what we naturally do as life scientists is tend to combine those zeros and ones to create proportions or percentages. Um, and those are going to be bounded at zero and at the maximum limit where all the individuals are ones, not zeros. And this binomial distribution has, looks very different from a Poisson in the sense that it can sometimes be left skewed when the mean is close to the maximum. In this case, I've plotted the mean number of males per clan as eight. And you can see that you get it squished up against the upper limit. Um, or it can be uh, right skewed the other way if the mean is close to zero. So I'm telling you all this just because when you're doing any kind of analysis of data in the life sciences, you need to have in the back of your mind the sorts of assumptions that you might be about to make about the data in order to perform analysis which tells you something interesting about the data. So the rest of the course we're going to do lots of analysis which looks at you know, asking important biological questions about data. But the bedrock of the way that we answer those questions is mathematical assumptions about the distribution of the data. So um, just to sort of recap what I said, we've looked at the binomial distribution, which is a discrete distribution. We're talking about discrete events. Either they happen or they don't. They're ones or zeros. Uh, and they can be, uh, be, that distribution can either be left skewed or right skewed or kind of more or less symmetrical if the mean's somewhere in the middle. We've looked at the Poisson distribution where there's no upper limit at all. We're still looking at a discrete distribution of discrete events. We're counting discrete events. Um, but when the mean is low, we're going to see right skew and um, because the distribution is bounded at zero. When the mean is high in that exact scenario, then the distribution starts to look like a normal distribution. Um, and in fact, we can approximate the Poisson distribution with the normal distribution. But we only get a truly normal distribution when we have truly continuous data. So they're not discrete and they're not bounded at zero or at any upper limit. Um, and that's the scenario in which we might expect to see a normal distribution. But unfortunately, we don't always see a normal distribution. Uh, the distribution we can get of a continuous variable might be skewed, even if there are no limits on the data. But we also know of situations where there are continuous data like temperature or time, which are bounded at zero very commonly, but potentially at some other value, like absolute zero of uh, temperature, which is minus 273 Celsius. Phew. OK, so our, that was probably all a little bit much to take in. Um, and it's one of the more um, sort of mind numbing bits of these lectures, hopefully. Uh, and as you'll see in the next lecture, in lecture three, we're going to sort of put to one side all of these concerns about data and distributions, step back and think about good experimental design, as is exemplified by this chap um, doing this to this unfortunate child. And I'll leave you to wonder what that might be about until the next lecture. Thanks very much for listening.